the Irish guy and welcome back to the latest edition of the Prem Catch-Up. Uh, I hate the name. I absolutely hate the name. But right, let's take a look at all the action from Game Week 2 of the Premier League. Right, let's go. Aston Villa 2, Everton 1. Okay, yes, Aston Villa beat Everton by two goals to one. But uh, make no mistake about it. Steven Gerrard will have left for the park that afternoon. I immediately drove back to his mercy side house. I will probably ever repeatedly punch the pillow to death. I mean, Diego Carlos is Villa's big marquee signing of the summer, right? I mean, considering Newcastle United spent four weeks in January obsessed, full on obsessed with the Sevilla centre half. I mean, honestly, Eddie Howe was probably this close to jumping in a chartered jet to Spain and begging Carlos to join him in the bath. I mean, everyone knew that Newcastle were gonna snap him up this summer, and so instead, Gerard just snuck ahead of them in the queue to sign him on the 1st of June. Ozzy, this is like waking up at 6 a.m. to buy a cheeseburger before anyone else. I mean, this is like your mate telling you that he's about to chat up a girl once she comes back from the bathroom, and so instead, you run into the ladies live with flowers. Ah, don't do that. You'll probably get pepper sprayed in the face. But anyway, Carlos has just suffered a ruptured Achilles tendon. And so, back to the drawing board, Villa. Now you have to go and sign another center half. So, from the excitement of a Samba superstar to now, you'll probably just get Jason Denier on a free. You know that former Sutherland center back? Yeah, that's about as thrilling as a Pringles tube filled with poo. But it's good win for Villa. But, I mean, this is the season where I'm nervously looking at Danny Inks. You know, the same way you'd nervously look at your cat with diarrhea on the bed. I mean, after seven goals last season, this could really nicely be the campaign where he's finished. I mean, we have seen mid-table goal machines die at Villa Park before. I mean, in the blink of an eye, Darren Bent went from clinical England regular into some adult beanbag who probably was eating sausage rolls in the shower. So I'm glad to see that after a sloppy first touch, he has then recovered to slamming a first-time left foot shot past Jordan Pickford. Good! Danny still got it! For now. And then Emiliano Bodia closed the game out with a few minutes left. Where Luca Dina decided to score another own goal in this fixture. But for Everton, they weren't bad. I mean, yes, whenever I hear the words, oh nana, nah, I've been brainwashed to immediately wish that Rihanna loses her voice. I mean, honestly, 10 years ago, the radio played that song so often that towards the end of 2010, I would have sooner listened to a mixtape of my parents doing it on the couch. But yeah, Andre Onana, the midfield summer signing from Lille. Yeah. He looks like a good player so far. And as usual, Anthony Gordon was a live wire on the wing. And now that he's famous and hit the big time, he's decided to copy Jack Mate and dye his ginger hair blonde. Uh, oh, doesn't he look like he belongs in a boy band now? Again, no, he still looks like the type of scruffy guy who probably walks home from the match, nicking bikes from gardens and egging old ladies in the streets. Honestly, he looks like someone who should have been in the cast of Misfits. But apparently Chelsea have been 40 million pounds. <sighs> I'm going to repeat the same four words that I scream at the Sopranos whenever the protagonist tries to cheat on his wife. Um, don't do it, Tony! Does he? Does he want to be the next Ross Barkley? I mean, I'm sure that man was your hero as a child, right? Well, now he's just kept prisoner in the Stamford Bridge attic. I mean, Gord, don't do it. Sure, a move to the bright lights of West London is tempting. I mean, Champions League football, right? Or something you've only ever seen on TV, but no. Chelsea don't rate you. They're not gonna play you! I mean, Callum hudson Adoy is a guy who was linked to Bayern Munich as a kid. But now, he would probably chop up his own scrotum to swap places with Gordon. Ozzy, he's probably begging Frank Lampard to rescue him on a daily basis. So, in short, Gordon, stay where you are. Arsenal 4, Leicester 2. Arsenal are incredible. I have to say it, I was wrong about Mikel Arteta. Very, very wrong. But yeah, I was one of the many people who stupidly thought he was the Arsenal version of Solskjaer. But I mean, at least with Oli. I mean, he still scored the most important goal in the history of Man United. That's why he got the job. Arteta's legacy at the Emirates was about as enthralling as a shoebox filled with milk. I mean, honestly, Matthew Flamini had a far bigger claim to the throne than Arteta based on their playing career. But I realise that the Amazon documentary at times makes Arteta look like a corny lunatic. But you cannot argue with what's happening on the pitch right now. He's been there nearly three years. His vision is finally taking shape. This is what happens when you give a manager time. I mean, look. This is the team in the club's final game before Arteta took charge in 2019. I mean, look how different it is. Burton Leno on goal, who's since been sold to Fulham. A centre-back pairing of Callum Chambers and David Luiz. That is so painful to imagine. I was like trying to picture your grandmother in the nude. I mean, I remember a time when I thought that an experienced Luiz from Chelsea was a clever signing for the Gunners. Yeah, but as clever as eating jellyfish. And then the two fullbacks, 
Ainsley Maitland-Niles and Mikhail Saka, who is weirdly wearing the number 77 on his back. I'm sorry, what? I mean, neither player are full backs, and they still had a homesick daffodil and Lucas Herrera waffling away in the middle of the park, and they were hanging their hat on a teenage Reese Nelson on the wing, who, I'm sorry, give it three years, and this Arsenal wonder kid is just going to be playing for Coventry. And up front, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, who's soon going to be driving his Lambos into Stamford Bridge. And again, Joe Willock coming off the bench, who's soon going to be fighting for his place at Newcastle. I mean, given 18 months, he'll probably be loaned to Crystal Palace. So for Arteta to survive long enough in the job to be able to build this exciting, free-flowing team, and to be given a genuine superstar in Gabriel Jesus, I'm going to say it now. As a whole, it is without a doubt the best Arsenal team since 2013. I mean, when they signed Alexis Sanchez, I mean, he tried to carry the whole side on his back, and slowly the team as a whole got very worse. But that 2013 team, pre-Sanchez, the Wenger ball was beautiful to watch, epitomized by that Jack Wiltshire team wonder goal against Norwich. I mean, as is this one, the balance, the movement, the creativity, the strength of their defense. I mean, lad, William Saliba, despite the own goal, I mean, he still looks like the future. And I, I know they said all that about Rob Holding too, but I always knew they could make excited about signing some two million pound defender from Bolton. It was like excitedly screaming like a pig because your mom gave you socks on Christmas day. I mean, calm down. But honestly, Arteta, fair play. I was wrong. Chelsea 2, Tottenham 2. Since when are you allowed to pull someone's hair? I'm gonna say this. Antonio Conte versus Thomas Tuchel. Sure, Twitter and the media are drooling over this fiery managerial rivalry. And yeah, I suppose it had bite. And makes a nice change to the likes of Scott Parker and Brian Potter. Just give each other Disney brand handshakes with smoke smiles on their face. But all that this did was just remind me of the bust up between Conte and Mourinho. I mean, yesterday, yeah, Thomas Tuchel was offended by the Italian celebrating a goal. But that when Josie had to tell Conte to shut up while he was Manchester United boss, and then went into the press conference and blatantly just accused him of paying off refs in Italy. But Tuchel, in his post-match interview, he was so defensive and meek that his voice went so high, he sounded like a castrated Mickey Mouse. I don't know. Don't get me wrong. It was great to see, and the handshake was tense at the end, but I think, as a football society, we need more of Mourinho versus Conte. I mean, once this whole Tottenham thing goes up in flames by April, I would love to see Conte back at Juventus next season and going head-to-head -head with Roma for the league. I mean, the fact we've seen those two face off just seven times, and and none since the FA Cup final nearly four and a half years ago. I don't know about the rest of you, but I need more Conte versus Jose. As for the match, let's be honest, Chelsea should have won the game. I mean, for most of the match, Tottenham were poor with a capital P. I and mean, Conte is a man who probably spent last spring screaming in Daniel Levy's face that he needed more players. And yet, for a trip to Stamford Bridge, he doesn't pick a single newbie in his starting 11. Then, ugh, what was the point in spending all that money? Levy must be sitting in his press box and furiously chewing on his own tongue. I mean, this is like an impatient 10 year old going on and on and on, whining to his mum that he wants a PlayStation for Christmas. And so then, when she empties the family savings on the thing, and yet, by January, the kid has just stuffed the thing in the attic and chosen to instead read a book. I mean, she'll probably be tempted to whack him over the head with a plate. Again, Chelsea were brilliant, but Tuchel said Tottenham's two goals shouldn't have stood. Well, Harry Kane's last minute equaliser from a corner, no, that shouldn't have stood because Christian Romero, the utter villain of the day, he was blatantly yanking Marco Corella's hair, as if these were two housewives fighting on the floor of River Island for the last Gucci purse. And that was a joke brought to you by Graham Souness. Uh, uh, okay, not really, but still you get the point. But Pierre-Emile Hoiberg's goal shouldn't have been ruled out because Richarlison was in the way. Um, no, I hate that rule. I mean, ever since Czech Teote was deprived of an absolute wonder goal against Manchester City, purely for the reason that Johan Gufran was standing near Joe Hart. I mean, rest in peace, Czech. But he was robbed of just his second ever Newcastle goal. And similarly, ruling out Hoiberg's strike for that. No, to me, it's a stupid rule. But Kane's goal, Absolute nonsense. Yeah. But what I will say is that for the Chelsea fans, I'm sure back in June 2006, you were jumping around your kitchen and hugging your dog when Peter Crouch was scoring a late winning goal for England against Trinidad and Tobago. And guess what? He was grabbing Brent Sancho's hair. And I'm guessing right now, that man is sitting at home in a beanbag in Trinidad and watching this live feed on his phone and cackling like a drunk would be Goldberg. I, I, actually, actually, I, I, I've just looked it up. This man is a politician now. I, yeah, Peter, don't ever return to the Caribbean, or I'll probably demand the police break your knees. Nottingham Forest won West Ham nil. Okay, I have a lot to say about Nottingham Forest transfer window. They are signing everyone. Let me know if you want to see a full video on this topic, because honestly, I've never seen the like of this before. They are moving mad. As for the match, 
Listen, if a club comes up from the championship and it's been years since they've been in the top flight, then the power of the fans always carries them to a win. I mean, remember Huddersfield beating Newcastle in 2017? Or even Derby County, 11 point Derby County. The most embarrassing and worst perfect side of all time. Even in 2008, they began with a 2-2 draw against Portsmouth, against a Portsmouth team who'd soon win the FA Cup. So I expected a Forest win here, but really, Oh, they should have lost the match. I mean, Teo Owali scored the winning goal after it rebounded off his knee. I mean, West Ham had a goal ruled out and smacked the crossbar twice. And then we see the greasy sponge Declan Rice miss his penalty. I won't lie, when I see something like that, it fills my soul with joy. This is someone who is not good at penalties. And the fact that he was replaced during the Euro 2020 final. I mean, he thought he'd probably save the day and score the winning pen, right? Now, don't kid yourself, Deck. All that substitution did was just save you an entire summer of having angry 10 year olds insult you on Instagram. I why does he keep taking spot kicks? Why does his ego keep making him do it? I mean, just give them to Mikel Antonio. Well, it's a good one for Forrest, but um. That look was off the charts. Brighton nil, Newcastle nil. Okay, Newcastle clumped on for this point. They really did. I mean, sure, Newcastle fans traveling the length of the country to visit Brighton and then not being able to celebrate any goals. On the face of it, that's probably about as anticlimactic as waiting six long years for the lost finale and being given no answers. But still, that's Newcastle. Take a point because that, that was the second half Brighton onslaught. I mean, right now, Geordies would probably all kiss Nick Pope on the mouth because he just saved their weekend from being ruined. I mean, weirdly, he was trending on Twitter before the match and then after it again. Honestly, there was so much mention of the word Pope on the internet, I was half expecting to find bishops crying in the street. And either that or instantly throwing the hard drives in a bin. Wolves nil full of nil. Yeah. Another nil nil and hands up. I did not watch this one. No. Not even a match of the day. I mean, it sounded so earth-shatteringly boring that the fans inside Molyneux probably spent half the second half just googling pig knobs on the internet. Or is that just me? The positive rule is that it's their first clean sheet with the back four. And more importantly, Morgan Gibbs White. This is a fellow who burst onto the scene in midfield four years ago. Pretty sure I remember Danny Murphy drooling all over him a match of the day. But after a few loans to the championship, everyone has just assumed that Wolves don't want him anymore. And I can understand why. I mean, it's like seeing your friend letting his classmates borrow his toothbrush. You would assume that he probably doesn't want it back. And that's why Everton and Nottingham Forest have been throwing paychecks at the club. And you'd have to think, yeah, they probably would cash in an English talent and just replace him with someone who's Portuguese. But after starting again, clearly, clearly he has that Wolves to stay. Oh yeah, and Alexander Mitrovic, after two goals last week, if he had just scored the winning goal from the penalty spot, then that would be three goals in two weeks. You'd be joint top scorer and would probably be linked with the deadline day switch to Man United. I mean, he used to work with Steve McLaren and after the Marco Arnautovic links, clearly that's all you need to qualify for the shopping list. But no, instead he missed. Which just reminds me of October 2020, when Mitrovic missed a costly Premier League penalty at Bramall Lane and uh, yeah, that was enough to destroy his fragile confidence because he then had to wait six months for his next goal. So lads, after that miss, I would get Mitrovic out of your fantasy league team and get him out now. Man City 4, Bournemouth 0. What? What was the point in this game? I applaud the Bournemouth fans for even bothering to go with the Eddie had because you were never going to see your team have any of the ball. Ederson knew he was getting a clean sheet from the moment he put on his football boots. Honestly, he was about as busy as a security guard at the library. I mean... Nothing happens at the library. What, you think you're gonna have to tackle someone in the queue because he was reading too much Harry Potter? I mean, simply, this is just a nothing, dead rubber match in the Premier League. And listen, I get Nottingham Forest fans wanting to make the trip to the Etihad, of course, but Bournemouth were only in the Premier League two years ago, so there's not even that much wonder and awe about the Etihad for them. So honestly, yeah, 4 0 nothing game. The biggest talking point was that Erling Haaland didn't score a goal, but yeah. 4-0 Man City win, what more is there to say? Southampton 2 leads 2. It was critical that Southampton did not lose this match. I mean, make no mistake about it, these two are in a relegation scrap. And so, when Rodrigo put Leeds 2 nil up after an hour, oh boy. Fair play to the Saints for coming back, and Joe Arebo's feet are underrated. I mean, decent point, but um, big miss for Leeds. Liverpool 1, Crystal Palace 1. Okay, Liverpool fans are probably chewing the inside of their hand. Two Premier League games down two draws. Now, to be fair, normally this wouldn't be a crisis. I mean, teams can start slowly and they have plenty of time to recover. Usually. I mean, this. This is how Man United began the 07-08 season. A nil-nil draw with Reading at home, a 1-1 draw at Portsmouth, and then losing in the derby. 
two points from three matches. And yeah, that still ended up being one of the greatest seasons that Manchester United have ever had. I mean, they still very nearly won the treble. But in this world where Man City regularly stick 90 plus points on the board, ah, uh, I get why Liverpool fans would be depressed. But lads, a quick word on Ebrecki Edzi. I thought that long term injury he picked up and the rise of Michael Anise had just sort of pushed him to the side of Crystal Palace. That this guy was just gonna be like Saido Berahino. I mean, sure, you get called up to the England squad once, but you die without ever getting a cap to your name. But all that, he's a. Uh, He's pure class, isn't he? I mean, the skill for the assist, playing Wolford Zaha, I, it was the pass of dreams. But listen, brilliant solo goal from Luis Diaz to rescue a point, but Darwin Nunes choosing to headbutt Joachim Anderson in the face. Yeah, I know he was provoking you, but so? You should have just copied the Matrix script and just smugly looked him in the eyes and just slowly and arrogantly said, Mr. Anderson. As if you're looking into the eyes of a snowman made of poo, and then you should have just walked away. Well, that's a... Uh, Liberal fans, we're very excited for this guy's debut. I mean, look at this guy on the internet. I mean, this was yesterday afternoon. If Darwin Nunes doesn't start tonight, then I won't watch the game. And then? I can watch Nunes bag a hat-trick now. And then? Prediction, 3-0 Liverpool, Nunes hat-trick. Yeah, that boy is probably now wiping his tears on a packet of crisps. I mean, I thought if your name was Darwin, you were supposed to be intelligent. But there, you just fallen into Anderson's trap. I mean, he doesn't exactly have the brains of a scientist. Anyway, that's for what you think. Let me know in the comment section below if you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe as always. I'll talk to you in a while.